notice the top uh, it's a um, it's images of eyes see those two marks on the top wings so if a bat is trying to overtake her or another predator they get very confused by these markings and they the insect winds up living because they attack and try to bite the uh, the images of the eyes because they think that's the body also the tails flap and confuse bats because it looks sort of like the antennas so uh, why do moths matter well everyone laughs including mike sorry mike about why do we study moths well Three, three main reasons. Number one, they're great pollinators. So if you have a garden or even a pot of planted, uh, you know, flowers on a deck or a patio, whatever visits that um, garden during the day, like bees and butterflies, at night there's 10 times more moths in Pennsylvania, right, or, and in the country. So you'll, you can have lots of different moths. Now, there's a surprise later about this moth, which has a 14-inch proboscis. But okay, so moths are pollinators, just like the bees, and they are also a good food source. So the Nature Center is 340 acres of woods, right, and we have lots of birdhouses, and it's a migratory flyway here, this part of the city. And um, when the birds fall out, you birders know this, they need a lot of protein. So what's better than a delicious caterpillar? So you can see this bluebird enjoying that caterpillar. And we know that even bears eat moths, right? Um, birds, lizards, mice, and bears. And also, you probably remember this from seventh grade um, biology, what a bioindicator is. These are what moths are too. So back in the 18th century, you know, they put a little canary in a cage and it's kind of morbid, but they're very sensitive to methane gas. So they would take it, you know, the miners would go down into the cave, uh, into the mine. And if the canary expired, then they knew they had a chance to run to safety, which is sorry for the canary, but that's because they're so sensitive. They tell us how we're doing with the ecosystem. So what's the difference between moths and butterflies? Well, this is something you can do at home. Butterflies rest with their wings up, moths with the wings down, but we'll practice that in a minute. <laughs> One of the most obvious things is that the antenna are feathery on a moth because it's a sex organ. And the, the male Luna is gonna be looking for his girlfriend with his feathery antennas, right? And um, the club antenna on a butterfly is very thin and slender. A butterfly's body is slender, and they can warm themselves in the sun, right? But a moth, uh, they have large bodies, and they're very heavy, and they're covered with what looks like fur, but it's not fur, it's scales, because they're both uh, in the Lepidoptera family. Mm -hmm. Resting wing position. Now, this is the important part, okay? If it's a butterfly, they rest with their wings up. You may do this at home. Okay, <laughs> moth, wings down, butterfly, butterfly, moth, butterfly. Okay, you get, the, you get the picture. So, but if you see an insect resting with its wings up, so chances are pretty good it's a butterfly. You can see the cecropia moth at the bottom with the wings down. And then this is a monarch on my driveway puddling for minerals. So also pro tip, <clears throat> excuse me, butterfly starts with a bee. And that's at the top of the alphabet. So you can move <laughs> up, down, and there's going to be a quiz. So we got to get ready. So here's an interesting uh, insect. If you have a flower garden and you have a, a trumpet shaped flowers, you may have seen what looks like a hummingbird, but it's not a hummingbird. It's a hummingbird hawk moth. And um, this was one that was visiting my hostas. And then on the other side is another one. They're clear wings too. So they, it's one of the only moths that hovers like a hummingbird. Very beautiful. And it's interesting because it's a day flyer. And what do we call that? Diurnal. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, right? Nocturnals, nighttime, diurnals, daytime. But what is twilight? This is your SAT uh, bonus word, crepuscular. And I'd like to see you try to use that in the next coming weeks and days. If you're with any nature people, just try to throw it in and get extra credit. So everybody knows this, right? Metamorphosis, this is the unique and amazing life cycle of moths and butterflies. Starts with an egg, goes into the caterpillar larva stage. That's that would be all right. That would be a good enough life cycle, right? But then the caterpillar grows 
eats and grows and changes five times. It's called instar. They molt and shed their skin and grow and grow. Next thing is the cocoon. This is another miracle. And, you know, there's a difference between uh, chrysalises and cocoons. You can remember the pro tip is moth has an O and cocoon has O's. So if, if it's a um, moth's cocoon, it's not a chrysalis, right? And people get that mixed up. But what happens with the uh, caterpillar? You eat, 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 and then it's time to make a cocoon. So caterpillars, uh, moth caterpillars, will go underneath um, foliage, maybe in your garden, underneath bushes and shrubs, and wrap up in a leaf, and then over winter, and then hatch into a moth. Or some of them have a couple broods per season. So please do me a favor and don't scrape up all and rake up all the material on the ground in your garden or in your yard. Put it in a bag and throw it in the landfill because you're probably scooping up a lot of insects and probably some chrysalises. Ooh, here's on the left. Can you see that tiny little caterpillar by my thumb? He's just hatched. And I think that was actually a black swallowtail on the parsley. But I have a friend that loves to go through her garden and just snap off a big handful of herbs and pop it in her mouth. But I told her, you know, you may want to turn those leaves over because you're getting a lot of extra protein with uh, any eggs or caterpillars. And who doesn't love a moth yearbook, right, with all the caterpillars? So, the, you know, the story, the hungry little caterpillar, that's no joke. That's what they do. So these are uh, insect moths you can see at the Nature Center. The top, take a look at this uh, life cycle of the hickory horn devil. S starts out a pretty small caterpillar, and then it grows into what some people find quite terrifying down in the left corner, right? The, the man's holding the, uh, the caterpillar, which goes into the, uh, into the ground and pupates over the winter, and then emerges as this stunning royal moth. And, um, you know, this is the woolly bear caterpillar. And you guys know that it's supposed to uh, predict the weather, just like the groundhog. So do you know what the, um, the story is? It's the wider the stripe in the center, the milder the winter. The darker the black stripes, the colder. And if the head of the caterpillar is super dark, that means a very severe winter coming on fast. And the Isabella tiger, is a beautiful moth that uh, is the result, the adult stage of that caterpillar. Ooh, if you want to have fun and you find a lot of caterpillars, set up a nursery. You can place the caterpillars in a container or a terrarium or something, but you have to close the top and it's no joke because they'll get out and uh, feed them tons and tons of food and they'll wrap into a cocoon and <clears throat> in a couple of weeks you'll have lots of insects, butterflies or moths to release in your garden. Ooh, Lauren Legend. Well, there's a kind of, um, people are fascinated with things that live at night, right? And they're always demonized, like bats are supposed to be scary and uh, owls are spooky and death head moths have gotten a very bad rap. And uh, they've been in, you know, uh, D Dracula, The Sphinx by Edgar Allan Poe. And who can forget the most terrifying film ever, The Silence of <laughs> right? That was a horror movie. And, uh, but the sphinxes are actually charming and very play, not playful, but I don't want to uh, pretend that they know what they're doing. They're interacting with us. But um, at Moth Night, they're fun because they can climb up and down. And if you put your finger out, they step up on your finger just like a canary. And uh, they're quite entertaining. Uh-oh. When I tell people about Moth Night, they go, ew, <laughs> I hate moths. They wreck my clothes. And I've explained that these are different moths. So if you want to keep your clothing in good shape, you cannot have a little spot of cafe latte or something because the female moth, which is the tiny little wool moth, will find the spot of food because she's making sure that her eggs, when her eggs hatch, the little larvae have something to eat. And after they eat whatever, the a little bit of spaghetti sauce or whatever, then they'll start eating the clothing. Please don't use uh, the DDT or whatever this is. This is not what we recommend. You can use pheromone lures like this, right? And that's how you catch them, which can be purchased anywhere. But anyway, that's the story with that kind of moth. I just want to show you quickly a couple different families of moths. The geometer moth, uh, 
if you're in the woods, did you ever see the little inchworm caterpillars inching along? This is this whole class of moths. And the moths are beautiful and they're, they have um, parallel lines that go across their wings. Silk moss, everybody's favorite. And of course, my favorite is the Luna. But you, a lot of people have noticed these because they will come to light if you leave a porch light on. And they only live uh, two or three days. So after they lay their eggs, then they die. So they're, um, they're often found fully intact in their gorgeous, they're about, you know, four or five inches long. The lichen and the tiger moss. Tiger moss are lovely and they come in millions of colors. And, you know, people say, well, moths are drab, butterflies are beautiful. Not really, the moths are gorgeous too. And here we, that's the Isabella tiger again and the willy bear. Here's the sphinxes. And uh, they're great and they come to light. So they're always fun at moth night. And you can see the different colorations there. It's fascinating how they can camouflage themselves. And here's the underwings. I love the underwings. So the top image you can see is the insect resting and it can be completely camouflaged. I think this is called the darling underwing. But if a predator comes, they, they flash their terrifying underwings and that's their, their move to uh, scare away uh, either a bat or a bird or whoever's after them. Another cool thing they do is in flight, they um, do kamikaze moves if a bat is trying to overtake them. I think that is fantastic. And here's an image of a bat chasing one down. They also jam the sonar chirp of bats. That's cool, right? You know, bats send out a, a, a sound that reflects and it's the sonar. So these insects, make another little clicking sound. And I do a bat night thing. So I'm very interested in this person who's coming. Mike, I can't wait to hear all about this. Okay. I have the little thing that, you know, we track the bats with this little electronics. Okay, so how do you even see moths? Well, unless you just see one at your porch light, uh, there's three ways to lure them. And two of them are light lures and one's sugar bait. So the first is the, uh, well, you know, first of all, bats, uh, bats, um, moths uh, travel and navigate with uh, transverse orientation, right? So that's reflected light of the moon. So the closest that we can bring into the woods, uh, that kind of light would be an ultraviolet light. So I use a mercury vapor light, which is really a good frequency. It's most identical to reflected moonlight or just a black light. So uh, we set up these lures and the, uh, the moths come and also a moth trap which is a box I'm going to show you and the moths come and get disoriented and fall into the box and we can observe them and release them and the other one is sugar bait all right so here's the moth trap uh, it's it's a do-it-yourself thing you just go online you can find out how to do it but I love making stuff and drilling and of course who can live without duct tape so those are the things you need and what happens is the uh, the light on the right you can see it's lit the moths come in close because they're curious and they're drawn to the light and they get disoriented and they fall through the baffles into the bottom and i put egg cartons in there so that they can rest in the crevices just like they would do on the uh, bark of a tree but then i looked out the window and this big thing was flapping around i said my god honey i was wake my husband up because i didn't know i'm there what is it and i went out and it was a capper so, you know, catbirds are buggers. So this catbird learned that when the trap was out, she could probably snatch something when I opened it up. Or here's the sheet lures. So remember back in the day when you went to the black light parties and people would have black lights? People with cotton on uh, had a lot of reflections. So we know that um, if you're setting up a lure, you need 100% cotton sheets. So I made this and sewed all these contraptions and then you get um, utility lights and you shine the light right on the sheet and that is the side that the moss will come to. So this all has to be done before it gets dark, right? And a lot of extension cords. Oh, and here's the sugar bait. Now it sounds disgusting. <laughs> the moss love it. And you mix up beer, banana and brown sugar. So I call it 3B and you let it rot in the sun or ferment in the sun, and it becomes the irresistible, like a bioidentical pheromone scent that lures the male moths. So what this story is, is 
as I told you, the, um, the male luna moth can track a female from about seven miles away. So the way the moths do this, the males go out at night of every species and go crisscross across the wind so that they can pick up the scent. So what I do is I do my sailor's trick and see which way the drift of wind comes and then set, it, set up the bait on these trees in about four feet off the ground in a big sheet about this big, you know, foot wide paint the, the lure on and it does smell kind of delicious i put molasses sometimes and then when it gets dark the males come so what you do is you put a red cellophane over your flashlight and you come up and crisscross across the tree so you don't startle them and you can see who's visiting and here's the egg cartons we pull those out of the moth trap and uh and you know, back in the day, there was only one little golden book, right? That was that was our Bible, this little book. And now you can get everything on your phone. And of course, I use all these different ID books. But uh, see how fun that is. And you, you can see this was a clemine, right? And when she opens her wings, it's a whole different pattern. And then down on the right, it was one of the sphinxes. And the sphinxes are funny. It's like Mark Spitz. When they're this like this little green one is resting on someone's finger, and when it's tired of that and ready to go, it'll start wah, pumping his, pumping up his arms like that because they're so heavy they have to get pumped before they can take off. That's fun to watch. Here's a sheet, and I'm just showing somebody one of our visitors, and we had a we do bio blitzes. That uh, this is down at Penn, which is a 24 hour record keeping thing where we keep track of everything that shows up every bird every insect and we're opening the trap to see who's in there so one thing i like to do i donated uh, to the academy of natural sciences which is a great museum and it has one of the biggest collections of lepidoptera in the world and uh, i don't advise people to collect and i do have a permit from a uh, parks and rec to collect because i teach but um Anyway, we keep those specimens because as the climate changes, we need that for DNA and for research. And there's a lot of cool things you can do if you're interested, including the City Nature Challenge. And I know they were doing this at the Nature Center, and they'll be doing it again, where you uh, keep track of everything on your phone, an iNaturalist app with Natural Geographic, and it's a whole global thing. And you can learn a lot about all the insects, and especially moss and keep track of all your stuff. These are some of the books I like. If you're interested in it, it's easy to find everything you need on the internet. But I love the idea of uh, people, we started this organization, Toxic Free Philly, so we're asking people to stop spraying herbicides all over the place. Like if you want more birds in your yard, you plant more flowers and pollinating species, native plants, so you'll get more insects that feed the birds and you get a whole wildlife habitat. So um, that's why I'm grateful to the Nature Center for providing all this education and also preserving several hundred acres of land. Mm -hmm. And that's my story. Thank you, Chris. So you, you can unshare now and then we'll come back and we can, that way we can see you bigger. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. So yep. if you have questions, please put them in chat and um, I'll, I'll, um, ask, um, I'll ask Chris your questions based on what's coming in chat. Just one thing I want to um, talk to you about. So butterflies tend to be more colorful. Moths tend to be less colorful. Um, and there is, there is always, you know, variations in any rule. But I just want to highlight one thing as I was thinking about it. So butterflies are daytime flyers, diurnal, right? And so um, they need color to see each other. That's how they find each other. That's how, they, that's how the male finds the female by the flash of those wings. They're looking for those colors. Moths are night flyers. Color doesn't, you, you really don't see color at night. Color kind of disappears. So moths invented a whole different way to find each other, right? Except I don't know if the predators can see color. Ah. Well, the bats aren't seeing any color. The bats are hearing and watching with the sonar. Uh, Birds, birds are going to see color. Well, they have uh, they have their warning colorations, right? Uh, right. A lot of moss and they have the eye spots, like uh, right, 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 right. But you know, thousands and thousands of them, all different kinds. Right. Sadie's asking, how many moths are diurnal? Hmm. 
probably the only one I know off my off the top of my head is the hawk, the hummingbird hawk moth. Right. There's very few of them. That's the only one I've found in all these moth nights. But if somebody sees a nocturnal moth during the day, is that a sign of that's about to pass away? Yeah, could be. Especially uh, if it's a big silk, if it's in the silk family, like the Luna and the, the big Prometheus and the, you know, Cecropia moth. Right. Is light pollution negatively impacting moths? It is. It's negatively impacting birds and moths. Yeah. Fireflies too, apparently. Yeah. yeah. And bats and and our whole ecosystem, but yeah. Right. Um, there was a great study, I remember this was classic, this goes back to when I was in high school, so it goes way back when they were studying smog in, I think in England, there was a, a family of moths who essentially disappear when they sit on a tree, They'll, they look like the bark, but as the trees got more sooty from uh, pollution from chimneys, the, suddenly the lighter ones you could see, and the, so the whole population of moths shifted like surprisingly quickly so natural selection selected for the darker ones. Uh, and so suddenly the darker ones became prominent and the lighter ones did not. That was always an interesting study. That was, I thought of that when you're, when you're talking about bioindicators and the canaries in the coal mine. And they have several, some of them, you know, like they have several broods of seasons. So that would give them enough time to rapidly adapt. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Kathy loved learning about the moths. Wow, that one moth has a 14 inch proboscis. Wonder if we can see that. Yes, we're gonna see that in a few minutes. I'm gonna talk for a few more minutes and then I, wanna sh I wanted to, this is the one thing I wanted to show with you. I'll tell you the story behind it too. It's a great story. It involves Charles Darwin and a surprise. And it's, a, it's just a, one of my favorite nature videos of all time. We'll get to it in one second. Um, Ed saw a moth resting on a tree trunk during the day, is that normal? It is normal, yeah, and I don't know if it was resting in camouflage. Um, right. A lot of times they're up in the canopy, it's a lot safer, so, yeah. Yeah, if you see nocturnal mammals, like especially bats during the day, that's usually a problem, or raccoons, that's often a signal that they might be rabid, uh, but that's not the same for moths. They have to rest somewhere. They do. Yeah. Usually they find a place where there's shelter and privacy, you know, they don't want to be exposed because... Yeah. Is there something you can plant to attract hummingbird moths specifically? Go online and look up the list of, um, of long-throated uh, uh, plants. Uh -huh. Native is not good. Native is better, right? Yeah. Like, uh, the trumpet vines, that's one of their favorite things. And, uh, well, I have hostas. Those aren't native, though. But um, anything with a long throat is good for them. Right. And I imagine they're going for the same flowers that hummingbirds are going for. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you plant a hummingbird flower, you might get them too. Yeah. The more, the more uh, variety and the bigger clumps. The other thing that I would suggest is just like you would plant for, um, well, you plant daytime for butterflies, the same with moths. You just don't plant X flower here, X flower here, X here. You get four or five of the same and you make a drift because it's very it's much easier for the females to see the drift of color and especially if you plant the host plants for um, butterflies and moths then the females can come and lay their eggs in that area because they know when the caterpillars hatch they'll be mowing it down so you're going to have to lose a lot of host plants but basically if you want to have these things in your yard you have to find out how much light you have, what's the soil composition, what zone you're in and blah, blah, blah. And then select your plants with a host plant for the insect mm -hmm. and pollinator nectar plants. Yep. Sadie points out that they love bee balm, which is, the, which is what you, your photograph had it on bee balm. Yeah. Had the, yeah. I have that outside. That's a nice native. Thank you, Sadie. Right. Bee balm is Menarda. Um, it's probably got other names too, but bee balm is Menarda and bee balm comes in a bright red and a more lavender. So there's two, two, two different kinds. Um, the red. lavender is behind me right now, but you can't see it, but it's right behind me. Yeah. <laughs> red, they like, uh, red is better because it's a little brighter. Right. But, but that's a great example of co-evolution of, of plants and insects. So this moth 
is once upon a time likely a nocturnal moth and discover somehow it something sends it down this pathway to become a, a diurnal moth that happens to mimic uh, a butterfly, uh, a hummingbird, but then get, I'm not sure where the clear wings come in, you know, why the. Can't be seen, right? Uh, the wings are translucent. So it gives it a little more, uh, I think, protection from predators, right? It's a, it's a smaller object visually. Right. There's a conversation in chat, Chris, about whether there's a movement in Philadelphia to reduce light pollution. Uh, there's a book called The End of Night that addresses this problem. Um, okay. And um, there's an organization, Biophily, that had a conference on light pollution and circadian health, but haven't organized um, an advocacy effort. Um, so we got some shout outs for the book, The End of Night, which people might want to read, uh, which is also apropos, there's this comet that's in the sky right now that's really hard to see. You have to drive like north for an hour if you really want to see this comet, so. Yeah. Yeah. How many moth varieties can be found in the center's preserve and what are the most common species? Whoa. Probably, well, there's 51 species in Pennsylvania. So, moths. you know, it depends what month you're in. You know how you birders, I keep referring to birders, but you know, in, in any season, the first migrants that come, right, come through and everything has their season. So when the plant, the host plant is ready, that's when the insects show up and that's when the birds show up. So it all goes right. through season. So uh, sphinxes, um, basically I have, you know, I have, I have a lot of moths that I would show you, right? A lot of big uh, silk moths, all like 15 kinds of sphinxes. Who can forget? Well, here's some sphinxes. You should be able to see these. Yep. Yeah, there's um, hundreds, maybe. No, probably not hundreds. There's only 51 in Pennsylvania, but there's Pudlenny. Maybe one day we'll have an outdoor moth thing. I think we have to. I think next year we're gonna, if we're, if you know, we're allowed, we, sh we should do moth night and you'll all come see. Um, yeah. Ooh, here's a great question. Um, what should I do with hornworms on my tomato plants? Also the most recent one I found had the predator's wasp eggs on its back. Can we reposition the hornworm on another plant that it will enjoy? I don't know. I'm not sure. What is their, um, the problem because they're eating down your culinary, uh, your culinary bed, right? So, yeah. You don't want to give it something else. Well, let's see what else. What else is their host plant, right? I think they eat a, a variety of things. So, so probably look that up, but it's probably something in the tomato family. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be yeah, surprised. Nightshade. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame. You don't want to kill every insect, but on the other hand, you did go to a lot of trouble for those tomatoes. So. All right. Can I sidestep for a moment now and let's look at this film? So let me do a little setup here for this. So it's it's 1862. Charles Darwin in England receives a package, uh, opens it up, and it's um, a couple of orchids from Madagascar. And the orchids have a, a nectar tube that's 14 inches long. Uh, and it's just crazy long. Um, and Darwin's pretty blown away. And he happens, he actually is, is writing a book on orchids. So after The Origin of Species, he did a couple of smaller books, uh, but one of them was on orchids. So he's, he's got these orchids and he predicts that there must be a moth that has a proboscis, a tongue, that can fit into that nectar tube and get the nectar at the bottom. And of course, he was, uh, he was, derided over his theory of evolution anyway, but many scientists thought that it was crazy um, that, he would, um, that he would suggest that. So um, it's not until 1903 that this moth is discovered, um, but it's not seen a lot. And there's one of my favorite videos of all time is on YouTube, you can find it. Um, it's a scientist whose name is Phil. Um, so you'll see, you'll hear the name Phil, who's sitting in Madagascar next to this orchid. He set up a camera. He's got staff with us, and he's hoping to capture um, this. It's a five-minute video. I'm halfway in, just when he's going to turn on the infrared light, so he can the camera can see the moth, but the moth can't see the camera. So we're going to pick it up. Um, Somewhere in Africa. 
I have to get out of this and into this. The orchid is called the star orchid, the Madagascar star orchid. Sometimes I think he calls it the comet orchid too. So it's got several names, comet, because you got that big orchid and then the long tail. So here it comes. Watch him swatting all the bugs. This is really funny. <laughs> <laughs> and swap bugs. Yeah. <laughs> Not there, I bet. So that's, I just love, his reactions are so genuine and so sweet. He's so happy. And that, that proboscis, it just doesn't look real. Um, it almost looks like it defies evolution that, that this thing would, would work that way. But look at the effort it took to get it into the flower. Oh, hang on one second. I have to turn off. There we are. I left YouTube on. There we go. And uh, so the moth has a scientific name, uh, species, genus, species, and subspecies. And the subspecies is predicta. So this was the predicted moth. Uh, <laughs> So Darwin's moth, Darwin's sphinx moth, the predicted moth, yeah, it's great. Um, let's see, there's a bunch of things in here. Thank you, everybody. Um, some people are doing a live stream moth night at Bartram's Garden. That's great that they're doing that. Go Bartram's Garden. Any other herbs beside parsley that can be painted, planted as host plants for moths? Ooh, I would plant all of them. I don't know. Uh -huh. you, what you would do is... Um, See what else you have in your yard or in your garden, right? And what kind of trees you have. And you could predict by that what species you have. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if you're in the shade or if you're in the sun. But if you just want to grow herbs, I put a variety in. I don't think mint is one of their host plants, right? So I'm not really sure. You, you, it depends. Um, you have a whole ecosystem there, so I would see what else you have in the in the trees there. You know, I'm embarrassed to say I can name dozens of host plants for butterflies and have spent lots of time planting those. I can name almost no host plants of moss, I'm embarrassed to say, and I'm going to have to rectify that. Well, it's probably the same, right? Because they both nectar on right. Medina, right? And uh, I'm not sure what, well, for example, you don't want to plant milkweed in your herb garden, but the tussock milkweed moth uh, competes with the monarch for the uh, milkweed, right? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's kind of a shame, but the tussock, the little tussock moths are beautiful white moths, mm -hmm. which are fun to raise too. Um, Beth pointed out, iconservepa.org has great guides to native plants arranged by sunny, moist, shady, dry. Thank you, Beth. iconservepa.org. Um, Sally says tomato hornworms will move to tobacco, which is good. Hi, Sally. <laughs> um, several people are thanking you for an interesting talk. We appreciate that. I'm impressed that moths are pollinators. Do they have a negative, do they have any negative effects on your yard? Uh, and before we get to that, Chris, uh, just um, back to that video he was talking about, he used some, some really heavy scientific language, but essentially there was uh, in that nectar, it sounded like there was a little pollen package somewhere that he was expecting it to have pulled out and brought to the next flower. So he had, he didn't see that and he was looking for that. Yeah. But that's an important job that they play. Work that way. And that's why the moth needs the orchid and the orchid needs the moth. And there are flowers designed to be pollinated by moths. So white night blooming flowers that open at night and they're there for moths. Mm -hmm. Virginia Creeper, Sadie says it's for all sphinx moths. Oh, good. Yeah. Good, good. They're, those are really the, those are the big, chunky, handsome moths. Do moths migrate as some butterflies do? Asked Claire. Hi, Claire. They don't, as far as I know. Like the painted lady and the monarch, no. Not that I know of. Yep. There's a dragonfly that migrates. Yeah. I want, the globe trotter. A good question, though. Well, some of the moths that are pests, uh, agricultural pests, I wonder if they're considered migratory. They go, maybe they go with the crops, but I don't know if they go continent to continent. Right, right. Ed says he guesses that night pollinators like moths prefer white flowers. They do. 
and it's fun to grow those. I don't have the uh, the uh, habitat for it, but the moonflowers are beautiful, and uh, the moths come at night for those. Right. Yeah. So if people are interested in moths, we've we've talked about one thing they can do uh, of planting some flowers uh, for them, planting some plants for the hosts, other things. No, no herbicides, please. Right. Right. Yeah. And yep, yep. don't clean. You know, I went to the Queen's Garden, the Kew Gardens in London, because I thought, well, that'll be spectacular. And also locally to some of the uh, pleasure gardens that we have in our area that I don't want to name names. But those gardens are groomed and they don't want any weeds. And they're groomed and they're weeded and they're mulched. And they're kind of a moth and butterfly desert. Okay, because mm -hmm. everything is cleaned up from underneath the plant, which includes all the cocoons and the caterpillars and the insects. So uh, if you want wildlife, then you can take a little break and not make it such a, a groomed, manicured place where you live. Yeah. And there's actually a bunch of insects who would benefit from sort of messier yards. So um, I, I know uh, I leave the corners. Um, much to one of my daughter's chagrin, my yard's a little messier. <laughs> messier. <laughs> Tell her to call me. <laughs> exactly. Uh, right? You can get certified. Put up uh, the and, uh, You know, there's a million things you can do to make a habitat. If who's the certifier? Who's that certifier? Uh, Master Gardener certified. There from we go. Yeah, but there's a Penn State extension, but there's a lot of things to do. It depends if you want to, it's like a lot of, uh, making the plan is probably the thing that takes the longest, but then laying out the plan and installing things little by little, it's really fun. You just could put a couple birdhouses, a bird bath, plant some things, and bam, you have birds and butterflies and moths, and it's very pleasant. Yep, good, good. Eleanor says this is so informative. She came in late. We'll, we'll be able to watch this by logging on to Schuylkill Center. Yeah, we'll make this available and we'll try to figure out how to do that. So it is being recorded right now. So, yes. Yeah. I want to go back way back to something you said way at the beginning, which is that there are 10 species of moths for every species of butterfly. That's crazy. I know. That's why moth night is so important. We got to get <laughs> to the bottom of this, right? So I have a huge collection that I'm preserving. Right, I have butterflies from when I was in fourth grade, right? So people say you shouldn't collect, but it's like, mm, but that would have been dust. You know, if a butterfly or moth dies, the ants, it's gone in about 24 hours. So um, I don't want anybody collecting though, but there's a lot of moths out there and we don't know a lot about it, right? Like how do they, uh, how do they, we know that they travel with the light, but that's, we don't much. We don't know that much about the natural world, really, and we're learning a lot more. No, there's um. So when I was taking biology in college, so this dates me, but they were saying there, they were what we had named by then one and a half million species of critters across the planet, and a big chunk of them are insects. Mm -hmm. a big chunk of those are beetles. So beetles are sort of the, the you know, a huge component of the insect world. But um, this guy named Terry Irwin in the 1990s goes into the Amazon rainforest and shakes a tree over here and catches all the insects falling out of it and counts up the species and doesn't go that far away and shakes another tree over there and counts those species and sees what the overlap. And the shocking thing is how much overlap there isn't in the rainforest of trees that are relatively close together. In Pennsylvania, um, not a huge difference across the state in, in some of the species, uh, a lot of the insects, but in the rainforest, it was crazy. Terry Irwin postulates that there, there may be, again, I was saying there might've been between two and five million species across the whole planet. He thinks there could be 30 million species of just insects. So here we are, 2020, we don't even know within a factor of 10, how many species share this world with us. It's, it's a huge knowledge gap. It's an extraordinary thing. There are a lot of scientists filling that in all the time, but we, we can't tell you how many species share this earth with us yet. And we know that we're, we're knocking them down as quick as we can. So. Well, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> happy. We're happy. It's not raining. <laughs> for Magic Moth Night. And we had it inside, which is a first, right? Right. Very uh, interesting to do it this way. Ah, Longwood, uh, Ed says Longwood and some other gardens have metal gardens that are not so well groomed. 
true, true. Do moths also like meadows like butterflies? Maybe they should host, maybe they should host a moth night, absolutely. They should indeed, yeah. In fact, they've got, uh, Longwood has got some nice forests alongside some of those uh, ungroomed meadows. Some, that's probably got some good moth diversity going on there. Yeah, and as long as there's a lot of host plants for the caterpillars. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm delighted because over time, the whole culture is changing with the use of herbicides. And we're working, as you know, to change the, the law in public land in the city with our toxic free filly. So yeah. that's exciting. It's just yeah. that we're so accustomed to using it. So. Right, right, right. Yeah, I know people have been using Roundup a lot, and Roundup's getting a lot of attention now, and some of the some of the problems that it has. So, uh, yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. yeah. So maybe next year we'll do it outside. Let's see. I think we, I would love to. Anybody remember moth snowstorms? <laughs> I guess is that so many moths that it was like a snowstorm? Yeah. When we were little. When we were little. Yeah, there's um, actually, um, there's been some studies on the decreasing numbers, not diversity, but raw numbers of insects uh, for reasons that are mysterious, probably habitat loss, probably chemical, um, but there's fewer insects now than there used to be. Right, Sadie's typing, when you drove around at night, they would cover your windshield. Yes. Yeah. So, right. Um, and I think that's how most of us intersect with moths, one of two ways. One, they eat your clothes. The other is they cover your windshield as you drive uh, around at night. I think we need to get to know them a, a little bit differently and a little better. Yeah. Yeah. Well. And, and wipe the pizza sauce off your sweater when you put it in the closet. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to just let one little moth give every moth a bad name, right? Right. So uh, a group of kids once found a hickory hornworm at the Schuylkill Center uh, five or six years ago during summer camp. It, <laughs> that's a chunky guy. Wow. I mean, that was, that was like a cigar. It was like holding a cigar. <laughs> that is a great thing. Yeah. So great. That, that's, that's the one I have seen my whole life. Yep. That it, was impressive. I'm glad that they were outdoors playing and they weren't sitting in front of a screen and they were going, wow, look at this thing. What is that? Yep. Right? So of course we Googled what you should do with it and we just, we, well, we released it, but we wanted to release it where near where it wanted to be, yes. which was great. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why there's the, the beautiful uh, Royal Walnut moths. That's been interesting. Yep. So Chris, it's almost eight o'clock. Anything else you want to share with us? Just that I'm excited that people showed up for moth night. Thanks. Yeah. There were 60 of us. Sorry. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah. And uh, there's so many things. A lot of the stuff that I use, I got at the Nature Center, right? Mm -hmm. you, you have these really fun. Um, Lots of field guides. Things. Yeah. And all the guides. Mm -hmm. And not to mention hundreds of acres of uh, native plants and yeah. uh, undisturbed trails and woodlands, which is very interesting. And then meadows and fields and blah, blah, blah. So it's a great place. Thank you, Chris. So thank you, Chris. Chris Safa, she's a neighbor of the Schuylkill Center. As I think you can tell, uh, she's a master naturalist, a moth-er, uh, <laughs> a trail ambassador with Friends of the Wissahickon on, on the Philadelphia Parks and Recreation Commission. So thank you, Chris, for a great night. Thank you, everybody. Next week, the story of plastic. See the movie and come for a conversation. And then uh, we'll take a couple of weeks off and come back in September um, with honeybees first and then bats and COVID. Uh, meanwhile, come for a walk at the Nature Center. Come see what, what um, get, get your Nature RX or Nature Therapy, if you don't mind, um, and uh, become a member and support our work. So we're really thrilled that you're all here and hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everybody. Everybody. And everybody stay well, stay healthy. Talk to you soon. Thank you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>